Hello church, welcome to CPC Online and whether you're watching from this valley or another state or another country, we are so glad that you are here. This is week two of a series we're calling Unstuck. We're looking at ways we get or feel stuck and then we're looking at wisdom from God's word about how we get unstuck. And this week we're looking at a crucial way to get unstuck and that is to cultivate your community. Even though we're not here and able to worship in person at the church, that does not mean that the church is not gathering. We've said multiple times over many years that we don't go to church, we are the church. So today, this is going to be a loving reminder, but for a few of you, it might be, just a little warning, it might be a mild rebuke. You cannot let COVID cancel your community. We got to get this big idea out right at the start, and here it is. If you want to get unstuck, you must cultivate your community. You got to do it. Community is far too important to pass up. Its benefits are too rich to live without. It's connection and accountability. It's support and prayer. It's strength for storms. And we are in a long storm. I mean, how many times have you heard the phrase in the last few months, we are in an unprecedented season, we're in unprecedented times. For that reason, I came across a a tweet this week that I thought was so funny. It's from this guy right here. His name's Simon Hall, and it says, I don't know about y'all, but I could really go for some precedented times. I thought that was funny. We know that we need energy from other people to spur us on, to motivate us toward being unstuck. The author of Hebrews says it this way in chapter 10. He says, let us consider, let's think about how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That phrase in yellow, spur one another on, in some translations, it says motivate each other forward or motivate each other toward. It's a, it's a literal metaphor for moving someone, getting them unstuck toward love and good deeds. So he says, how do we do it? Here's how. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Eugene Peterson well-known pastor and author who passed away this last year, in his famous book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, he said this, Scripture knows nothing of a solitary Christian. People of faith are always members of a community. Did you know the word in the Greek for one another, which is alalon, occurs over 100 times in the New Testament, and 59 of those are commands, imperatives, about how we should relate to or not relate to one another. The implications are obvious. Community is not optional. It's imperative. So now you see the problem. You see the rub, the challenge, the issue. The very thing that we know we need to do to get unstuck, to spur one another on toward love and good deeds, and to experience benefits like support and prayer and accountability and encouragement and strength for storms, because we're living in these unprecedented times, because of this COVID season, we're not allowed to do it or gather as we normally do. So there are a few things that I know about us right now, and I'll just put them on the screen here for us. A few things that are true about us. First of all, we're more sheltered than ever before, literally sheltering in place for six months. Here's another thing. We're more isolated than ever before. I think our isolation was even heightened this week as the heat rose and all the fires broke out. And because of those two things, here's the third thing. We need community more than ever before. It's starting to, for many people, it has affected our mental health. See, I used to preach this type of message on community, and almost the whole message was about why you need community. I don't need to do that this time. You know you need community. I know I need community. There's probably a few people who are holding out, going like, I don't really need community. By the way, extroverts, we're desperate for it. We love people. We recharge with people. I can't wait to see people. Even introverts, though, who recharge solo are going like, I'm ready. I'm ready to see some people. There's probably just a few of you sitting at home right now going, "Uh uh-uh, arms crossed, shaking your head. I don't need anybody. For you, you should, if you're thinking that, if you're thinking, no, I'm good, me, myself, and I, go to cpcdanville.org, go back about two years and watch the message titled, Why You Need Community. But for, de- for today, it's not why we need community. It's how 
to cultivate community. We can't get through this. We can't survive. We certainly can't thrive without community. We need the life-giving friendship. We need some ride or dies. We need some encouragement that comes through community. So the entire message for the rest of our minutes is three ways to cultivate community. And I promise these are going to be pandemic approved. They're COVID friendly. But here's a fair warning. I'm coming in hot, bringing high heat with point number one. Here we go. Stop making excuses. Seek out community and connect you got to work for it. Now, if you're going, you're coming in too hot on this first one, i got to start with this story. And the story is just a reminder. It's a little proof that I'm not, pre- yeah, I'm preaching at you, but I'm preaching first and foremost at myself. And here's why. Bridget and I are in a small group, a couples group, and it meets every other Monday night. And true confessions right now during COVID, we have been sporadic at best. And it's all the normal reasons. It's COVID. It's sheltering place. Zoom gets old. Then summer. Then travel. Now we're back to school. I just have to say, this is a reminder to you as well and also to me, that every time you miss, every time you skip, it makes it easier to miss or skip the next time. It's kind of like a workout that way. So this last Monday night, Bridget and the boys got home from the airport from Minnesota for the weekend. Quick little trip there. And we had this heat wave. We didn't have AC. We still don't have AC. It's been a rough week in the Scott household that way. And we're trying to figure out how we're going to meet on Monday night. Are we going to Zoom? Are we going to do it in person? Is it going to be a hybrid? Who's going to host? And I got frustrated. And I was hungry. And I was tired. And I was irritable. And I was hot. So finally, I just texted the whole group, we're out. We didn't go. Tuesday morning, here's what happened. I wake up, have a little time in the Word, start to pray, and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of me, and we have this conversation, God, and me. He says to me, you bailed. You're not working for it. You're making excuses. You're not leading. You're neglecting something that you know you need. I mean, you need it as a follower of Jesus, and you need it as a husband, and you need it as a friend, and you need it as a dad, and your wife needs it. And you're struggling, and she's struggling, and your kids need you to be there. They need to see you go, and they need to benefit from you being in community, even if it takes more work. So I want to just let you in on the text. Send a long text to my small group. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but I am just going to show you how it started and how I finished it, and see if you can relate. The title is, I'm really sorry for bailing on our group. Sorry for bailing on our group last night. I shouldn't have done that. I should have just Zoomed, so at least we could catch up and connect and encourage and pray for each other. Uh, We have no AC. Bridget was just getting home from being away for four days with Owen and Cole. They showed up starving and ornery and blah, blah, blah. These are all excuses. Do you see that? These are all excuses, but that's the thing. We all always have a bunch of excuses, and so did I last night. And I'm sorry. And then I went on to list about maybe how we could reprioritize the group and meet and talk next time. And here's how I wrapped up this apologetic text. I said, life is hard. And if I'm honest, we are needing support and encouragement that comes with community to go through it with joy and perseverance. All feedback is welcome. I love you all. I miss you all. And guess what? I have to preach on community this week. Like I said, I need prayer. Love you. So yeah, I'm preaching to you, but I'm first and foremost preaching at myself. Stop making excuses, pastor. Seek out community and connect. And what do we find in community? We'll look at Psalm 133. David says this, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together, do life together in unity. And then he gives this metaphor of blessing. Here's what he says. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. These are multiple pictures, metaphors of blessing. Precious oil, that's anointing oil. It's blessing, but not just anointed on the forehead. It's poured on the head. It's running down on Aaron's beard. That's the high priest at the time. It's down the collar of the robe. He's being blessed abundantly by God in community. It's as if the dew of Hermon, that's Mount Hermon, the highest point in Israel. It's coming down, falling on Mount Zion, a reference to the city of Jerusalem. And then David wraps up the psalm this way. He says, for there, and he's not talking about Zion or Mount Hermon. He's saying, for there in community, there when people do life together, the Lord bestows his blessing, even life 
forevermore. Interestingly, for context, Psalm 133 is one of the Psalms of Ascent. The Psalms of Ascent are Psalm 120 to 134, 15 psalms that the Israelites would sing as they went up en masse three times a year up to the city on a hill to Jerusalem. They would sing these psalms and songs together and symbolically, literally, and physically, they would be showing that they lived their lives upward to God and they lived their lives outward with and for one another in community. And in that community, doing life together, there was blessing. Similarly, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is talking about a great friendship that he has. It's a blessing in his life, and it's his relationship with Timothy. It's in the the letter to the Philippian church. In chapter 2, he says this, I hope to send Timothy to you soon. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. You know that Timothy has proved himself. That word for proved himself in the Greek is dokimon. It means reliable. He's reliable. You can count on, I can count on Timothy because as a son, he's like a son. He has served with me in the work of the gospel. I think this phrase right here is one of the most profound uh, phrases about relationships in all of scripture. I have no one else like him. You have someone in your life like that? I hope so. I have no one else like him. I have no one else like her. I have no one else like them. We need those relationships in our life. Scripture is full of those types of relationships. In the Old Testament, David and Jonathan. In the New Testament, here Paul and Timothy. In other places, during Paul's missionary journey, he takes Barnabas. Barnabas' name means son of encouragement. I don't think that's an accident. You're crazy if you do. Paul knew how hard it would be, so he chose a a ministry partner who was an encourager. Life-giving relationships are also in the Old Testament. The relationship between Naomi and Ruth. Naomi, a woman from Bethlehem married to Elimelech, had two sons. They moved to Moab during a famine, and the two sons married Moabite women, one Orpah and one Ruth. Tragedy struck years later, and Naomi's husband and both of her sons died. Naomi became bitter. She said, matter of fact, don't refer to me as Naomi, which means pleasant in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, refer to me as Mara, which means bitter. I'm so bitter, the Lord is clearly unhappy with me. And on the way back to Bethlehem, she stopped and she turned to Orpah and Ruth and she said, you guys should go back to your land. You should rebuild your life. There's still blessing to be had for you. Interestingly, how they responded, Orpah said, okay, kissed her on the cheek and said, peace out. Ruth responded this way. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there, I will be buried. Ruth says, no matter what, where you go, I go. No matter where, where you stay, I stay. Your people, my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I'll die. No matter what, no matter where. If there's one thing that I've noticed and just, it's so clear over the last four or five months of sheltering in place in this pandemic is how rare and precious these types of no matter what, no matter where friendships are. Are and how lucky, how blessed by God we are if we have so much as one in our lives, let alone if we have multiple. How good, how beautiful, what a blessing it is. Multiple times during this season, I've said, gosh, no matter what, no matter where, friends, I'm so grateful for them. I've said to God, I have no one else like them. Thank you, Lord. Perhaps some of you perhaps many, as you take stock of your life relationally in this season, you go, man, if, I, if I'm honest, I don't have any relationships like that. I poured a ton of time and energy into superficial 
casual relationships. I, I don't have I don't have one, no matter what, no matter where, friends. Here's my here's my encouragement to you. It's an action step that you could take. If you want a no matter what, no matter where person in your life, you have to be a no matter what, no matter where person for others. And if you're watching right now, regardless of your age or life stage, any demographic represented in all of them, still in this season during COVID, I want to put a slide up that shows all the different environments, all the different ages and life stages where we have community here for you at CPC. Still right now, small groups, over 60 of them meeting still during COVID, either Zooming or in person or a combination. Student ministries meeting in person and a little bit on Zoom. Uh, young adults getting ready to start. Women's ministries getting ready to start. Almost 400 women already signed up with a few weeks out before they launch. Men's fraternity ready to relaunch, by the way, with Hugh Halter as a men's ministry leader here at CPC the week after uh, Labor Day. It's going to be incredible. Care groups, senior adults, which by the way are meeting in drive through to be safe. They're driving through because they're an at-risk community. And speaking of driving through, I want to invite you, don't miss out on this next Sunday night. We, we're not have a drive-through communion. We have a drive-in communion service from 5.30 to 6.30 on Sunday night. And we can take about 300 cars. You're going to come in. We're going to park you. We're going to have live worship. We're going to have live teaching. And we're going to take communion. We're going to receive communion together all at once. <laughs> Just to be clear, this is the closest thing to a, like a live service how we used to do it. We're going to do an outdoor socially distanced in our cars and broadcast over radio. It's the closest thing in almost six months to a live worship service. Don't miss out on this chance to be connected in community. For those of you who want to be in community, you're going, I want some of those friends. I need some of those friends. I need the blessing of support and encouragement and accountability and all those things that we've mentioned. This is your step. If you go back to that slide that shows you've got to go to, to connect at cpcdanville.org. It'll come up in just a minute. Connect at cpcdanville.org. There is a team of people waiting for you at this email address. They won't sleep and they won't stop until you get connected into a group. I promise you that. I get it. Lots of excuses. So easy to make. That's COVID. Everything is, everything is blamed on COVID right now. It's because of COVID. Or I'm, I'm too busy. I travel. The kids, the school are out of rhythm. My wife this, my husband that. My house is too small to host. My house is too big to host. I don't want to intimidate anybody. All these different, I'm too scared. Others are too scared. On and on and on. Even though we can social distance now. Even though we can be outside and meet together in person. As my high school football coach used to say, and I loved it when he said it. He would just look right at people and he would say this. Excuses get you beat. Stop making excuses, myself included. Seek out community and connect. You need the support and the prayer and the connection and the accountability and the encouragement and the no matter what, no matter where, I have no one else like them, friends, in your life. Here's the second thing, second way to cultivate your community. Go to friends and neighbors and invite. Go to friends and neighbors and invite. You have friends. Invite them to watch church online with you at your home. You have neighbors. Invite them to join you for online church. Social bubbles are a real thing and they are acceptable right now. So let's leverage them for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Here's just a, a catchy way to say it. Turn your house into a house church. Turn your house into a house church. Do it right now. We're just calling them watch parties. Host a watch party at your church with your friends or your neighbors or your small group. You can do it in person and you can also do this virtually if you, you're an at-risk person or you can't do it with other people right now. I have this vision, I have this picture that we would have hundreds during this season, hundreds of watch parties 
where, where the church was gathering in homes all over this valley every single week. And just so you get clear instruction on how simple and easy and doable this is, here are some simple steps to host one of these watch parties. Invite friends and neighbors to a watch party. Watch the service together. Discuss the questions after and enjoy a meal together. You could cook it before. You could cook it during the service. You could cook it afterward. It could be breakfast. It could be lunch. It could be brunch. This is how you host a watch party in simplest terms. You could do this, and you could do it outside, and you could do it inside, and you could do it in your backyard, and you could do it in your front yard. You could do it anyway. You could do it virtually as well. You could do it in your driveway. And when you do this, you will be just acting out the same way that the New Testament church was born. Look at Acts chapter 2 at verse 42. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They watched the service. And to fellowship. They invited their friends and neighbors. And to sharing in meals. They cooked a meal together, including the Lord's Supper. And to prayer. They did discussion questions. And they prayed. Did a little search in the Bible, in the New Testament, of the phrase gathered in homes. No less than 14 times is that phrase mentioned in the New Testament. It's so clear that in the earliest days of the church that lots of people gathered regularly to worship in their homes. Speaking of that, this week, the Lord renewed in me a, a sense of awareness and love for and prayer for my actual neighbors, my neighbors in my neighborhood. They were on my mind, they were on my heart. I prayed for them personally. We prayed for them at our staff meeting. And the Holy Spirit prompted me this week as I was praying for them, why haven't you invited them to your house to watch the service? Like I, I watch every single service usually two or three times and that's after preaching in most of them. I know what's coming. But I watch it admittedly with a little bit of a critical eye. I'm looking for ways to improve, whether it's messaging or transitions or stuff like that. And the Holy Spirit just in a sweet way kind of reminded me this week, hey, it's, it's not even about you, Pastor. I mean, I love you. I gave my son for you. I gave my life for you. But it's not about you. I'm trying to work in and through you to reach and to love and to be for your neighbors. So why don't you invite them? And so I started to think, okay, We've lived there 14 years in our house. How many times, are there any times that we've sincerely invited, went around and invited our neighbors to anything in our house, be it a breakfast, a lunch, a dinner, a barbecue, or even a Bible study? Are there any times in 14 years when we didn't offer a sincere in-person invitation that the majority of them didn't show up, say yes and show up, and the answer is no, Almost every time, almost all of them show up. The Lord brought conviction over that. Invite your neighbors to your house to watch church. What about you? Have you considered doing the same thing? Cultivating your community right where you live. Taking the focus off yourself, putting it on, connecting with other people, trying to reach your neighbors for Christ by hosting a watch party. Go to your friends and neighbors and invite them. One last thing. This could be your small group. You could do this with your small group. Your small group could be your church. Invite them over. If you don't have neighbors or you don't know your neighbors or your neighbors say no. When we can't have church as, as usual and we know we need to connect, turn your house into a house church. Invite your neighbors and friends for a watch party. Watch the service. Discuss the questions. Enjoy a meal. Simple as that. And by the way, when you do this, straight old school. Like what happened in Acts chapter 2 when they started doing this? Well, let's look a couple of verses later. They worshiped together in the temple courts. By the way, that was outdoors. Each day they met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So don't miss this. Not only did they get blessed in terms of their fellowship? They also added people be, being saved. The church grew while they were worshiping in their homes. I love that. Okay, one more thing. One more thing. Here's the third way to cultivate your community. Pray for other people and bless them. 
Might seem simple, but let me explain. Pray for them. We're a church that's for the valley. For far too long, the church has been known for what it's against. We want to be known for what we're for. We're for the people of this valley, and we're for you. Do you want to show other people that you're for them? Pray for them. Pray for other people. Gives you a heart for them. And then bless them. Let me explain. I love Proverbs 11 at verse 25. Here's what it says. It's a promise, really. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I love that word. I love that word from the Lord, from the wisdom literature. Let's look at the word blessing this week in Scripture. It's an interesting word. It's an old English word, and surprisingly, to me at least, you don't find it that much in the Bible. Like you see a bunch of its equivalents, but you can rummage around deep enough and you can find its origins. It's, it's, it's an ing, old English word and blessed literally means to add strength to one's arm. That's what it means to bless someone. You strengthen them. You make them stronger. You build them up. You make them more of who they are. So here's the picture. Here's the application that I got this week. What if we were a church that's so for the valley? What if we were a church where, and here you could do this, every week on Monday morning, on Monday morning, you get down on your knees and you pray a simple prayer to God. You say, and here's the prayer right here. Who do you want me to bless this week? Lord, I'm asking, who, I'm praying for them, Who do you want me to bless this week? And my suggestion, my recommendation for you is to make one of them a Christian, a brother or sister in Christ. I I would try to bless three people a week. Totally doable. Totally doable. And it'll bring your your community and your, your thought life and your prayer life rising quickly. I would bless one Christian, brother or sister in Christ. I would bless one non Christian, someone who doesn't know Jesus yet. And I would bless one person that you don't even know. No, could be a stranger, could be an acquaintance, could be something where you know them a little bit, but you don't know whether they're a Christian or a non-Christian, you don't know if they have faith in Jesus yet. But bless those people, you might go, how do I bless them? What is blessing? Well, let me give you, let me give you some insight of that. There are usually about three categories where, where blessings fall into, and they're very, very logical. Here's the first one, acts of kindness. You mow their lawn, you watch their kids, you bring them a meal, something like that. Here's another thing, gifts. And, and this is something where you see a need and you meet a need. It could be money. Again, it could be a meal. It could be something else. You give them a gift because you're meeting a need. Or maybe the easiest and most common one is words of affirmation. Man, that can lift the spirit of a person. That could be such a blessing to a person. And just to clarify that, it's not just a compliment. Hey, nice outfit. Hey, I love your shoes. Uh, a word of affirmation is you, you acknowledge that, there, you know, I see something in you. I've noticed something. I appreciate something about you, and it brings me encouragement or reminds me of the Lord Jesus. It's amazing what that type of life-giving word does as you use it to bless other people. And here's what's going to happen, by the way. If and when you do this, you're going to experience this right here. I call it the ricochet effect of blessing. Blessings start bouncing around all, all the time. Now, this is not why you do it. You don't do it to experience the ricochet effect of blessing. But let me tell you what happens. When you bless someone else, they are likely to look for ways to bless other people. When you bless somebody else. And what is a guarantee, because scripture just said it in Proverbs 11 at verse 25, it's a guarantee that you yourself will be refreshed. You yourself will be blessed because God, as we know, is a promise keeper. That is absolutely going to happen. You might be sitting here going, I, I'm not like a spiritual person. I'm not a God person. I don't believe that. But show me the science. There's tons of science that shows that blessing other people gives you a lift psychologically, emotionally, physically, and even from the perspective of mental health. You might be still resistant. You're going, really, this blessing other, praying for people and blessing them? Is this really how to cultivate my community? I would say yes, because it binds you to the people that you've blessed. It builds a community and a network based on generosity and grace. So finally, I want to close with this. It's a story about the power of unexpected blessing. 
a couple of weeks ago, I walked into my office. It was at the beginning of a week, and I was tired, and I was discouraged a little bit. And I walked into my office, and I walked up to my desk, and here's what I saw. I saw a card on my desk. It said, so very grateful on the front. Now, I immediately thought, oh, it's a card for me to sign, because a lot of times people will leave a, a card on my desk for me to sign because we're giving it to somebody else. So I opened it up thinking that was the case, but it, t- it turns out it was a card from me. And here's what it said. Hi, Tyler. After waiting for the right time, and what does that even mean? The only time we have is now. I decided that our world has created a sense of urgency we dare not ignore. So here's the note I've wanted to send you for years. I've been attending CPC since 1963, 57 years. And my husband and I were married and became members of CPC in 1983. Took you a long time to join, but just just kidding. Were it not for, I love this line, were it not for L'Oreal, I'd be a gray hair. But here's the thing, we love you, we appreciate you, and we pray for you. We appreciate your authenticity so much. The older we get, the less time we have for a veneer. We're all on the struggle bus together. We also recognize and need to acknowledge that God has placed you in leadership at CPC for such a time as this, being the conduit of our Abba's peace, hope, mercy, grace, and love to yourself, family, our valley, and beyond. She writes, we do pray for your heart and mind to be guarded and grounded in him. By the way, this is before I preached on fixing your thoughts on him last week. We also pray that you will recognize any temptations in their source and relinquish them to the rescuer. We miss laughing and crying and worshiping and serving. And we miss giving with you up close and personal. But we honor how you are approaching the pandemic and other issues with wisdom, respect, and most importantly, scripture. We love you and are so thankful for who you are and whose you are and they sign it with COVID non-compliant hugs, and it says their names. I just read that, and I've read it a few times since, and almost every time it brings me to tears. They have no idea how much I needed this. Here's my question for you. What member of your family need something like this? What member of your small group, what, what neighbor, what friend needs something like this? I think the truth is we all need this. I need this. You need this. And we can't let COVID cancel our community. You must, to get unstuck, you must cultivate your community. How? Stop making excuses. Seek out community and connect Go to your friends and neighbors and invite them. Turn your house into a house church. Pray for other people and bless them. In a minute, I'm going to pray for you. But first, I want to invite you and remind you to take the few minutes to discuss these questions with the group that you're watching. It could be your family. It could be friends. It could be your small group. Or if you have to call someone to discuss it, if you're watching them alone, go through these discussion questions. Describe a time in your life where you experience the rich blessings of community. Number two, what steps can you take to host a watch party? And three, who might God be telling you to pray for and bless this week and why? Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the blessing of community. For the brothers and sisters who have a life with friends who are no matter what, no matter where friends, I thank you for them. I pray your blessing over those relationships and friendships. I pray that those who benefit from them would know the blessing that they have. But for the brothers and sisters who don't have that, who want that, and who we know desperately need that, even or especially during this season, prompt them, give them the courage, convict them to take that next step to send an email to connect at cpcdanville.org, to reach out to an old friend, to re-engage with the group that they've been, well, not seeking out as of late. And God, help us to experience the rich blessings 
of community. You did not intend for us to live alone. You created us for community. First with you, we acknowledge first with you, delight ourselves in the Lord first, and then he'll give us the desires of our heart, Psalm 37, 4. And yet you also made us for relationship with and for one another. We're not supposed to do life together. Scripture knows nothing of a solitary Christian. God, encourage us, convict us, and then move us to respond to your good and living word. We pray all these things in the name of your son Jesus and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.